Okay, so thank you for coming back. Um, so we concluded last week with this uh, switching lemma that I basically introduced but didn't really tell you how you use it. I just told you many things are application of it. So I want to take the time to tell you a little bit more about the applications because it's going to look like always trivial I mean applications, but they, they were actually difficult theorems to get in the first place. If you have this lemma, then it's very simple. But historically, people uh, got these things by more complicated arguments. Not all of this, but... Uh. So first, let me remind you Fb. Here is a set of k, I mean of n, so that there exists k smaller or equal to n with sources of k equal b. That doesn't mean that the sources of n are equal to b. It just means you can find a smaller current that has these sources. So k, k less than equal to n means at each... Uh, yeah, exactly. It means the ordering on functions from edges to n. So it just means at every edge, the current of k is smaller than the current of, of, uh, of n. So actually, maybe the most important information you, could, you should keep in mind is that if b is just two vertices x and y, then finding a smaller current which has sources x and y, it's really just saying there exists a path between x and y. So in the definition of FP, the, the graph H doesn't appear. Is that intentional or not? Of, oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, you are quite right, sorry. So N1 plus N2 restricted to H. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, that's very important. And you are <laughs> otherwise, the statement would not at all depend on H. You are right. So if I restrict my current to H, I can find a subcurrent that has a thing. Uh, thank you very much for this correction. So fx connected, uh, F fxy is just going to be the set of n such that x is connected to y in n, where here I'm going to use a notation which is fairly intuitive, meaning there exists a path of edges from x to y. with positive current. <laughs> okay. So here you have x and y, you have your current, and what you at least need to find is one pass from x to y in the current. Okay? Okay. So let's prove this lemma and then go back to the, the applications. The proof of the lemma is not going to be that complicated. In fact, it's pretty elementary even. So we are going to start with the left side, say. So here I'm not going to repeat the two things on the left side. Let me drop the beta, okay? So WFN1, WFN2. And here I'm going to just make the change of variable that N1 is equal to, I mean, maybe N2. Oh, well, I didn't write the proof. Let's see. So N1 plus N2, I'm going to call it M. And N2, I'm going to call it N. Okay? So if I make this change of variable, what do I get? Here, M is a current on edges of G, and its boundary, I mean, its set of sources is a symmetric difference with B, because I'm doing the sum of a current with sources A and a current with sources B. And then I'm summing over N currents of H, such that two things, N should be equal to M, and the sources of N should be equal to B. Right? 
and then I get f of m. And wn1, wm2, I could write it as w of m minus n times w of n. But I can also, and this is fairly easy to see, write it as w of m times n choose m, where here I mean by that product of edges of nxy choose mxy. This is just these guys, let's remember what they are, so indeed. Wn1, Wn2 is a product of edges. There is this beta jxy to the power n1xy plus n2xy. This is perfect, it will give me mxy. And then there is a 1 over n1xy factorial and 2xy factorial. Right? This is the product of these two things. Now, if I include n1 plus n2 xy factorial, here I see w of m, and here I see this quantity. Okay? So up to now, I didn't do much. OK, and if I try on the other side, I'm going to end up by doing the same change of variable with a sum. This time m is, I mean, again, a current on edges of g. And again, it has sources A symmetric difference with B. This time n is an a set of edge, I mean of current, it's still satisfying this. But and that's the difference here. N has no sources. I get f of m, I get w of m, and I get m choose n, indicator that m belongs to fb, right? So my question is why, what I need to answer is why do I have an equality here? Okay? And you will notice that it will, you will have an equality and it's in fact because it's valid for every f, it's if and only if, you have the following identity. So let's prove that for every m, so if I take any current with sources A symmetric difference with B, then here's a sum for n currents on H of n smaller or equal to m and sources B of n choose m is equal to this thing. Let's prove that. Right? I mean, I can here, here I can put f, which is just the indicator that m is equal to a certain m0. So there is no loss of generality in trying to prove that. So I fix m. OK. So that's where we are going to use a cool interpretation of random currents. I want to be understanding this type of combinatorial factor, OK? And I'm going to do it as follow. So associate with m the multigraph, let's call it m round, 
define as follows. So you put your vertices. It says these are the vertices of your graph. And you have a current on each vertex. Say 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 3. Okay? So what you do is that you associate the graph which has as many edges between vertices and between two vertices as the current gives you, the number of the current. So here it's going to be 2. Here it's 1, 1, 1, 3. And zero. This is M. Okay? So put as many edges. I mean put NXY edges between uh, MXY, sorry, between X and Y. So it's a multigraph, a priori there are multiple edges. Now when I look at n, choose m, this is what? It becomes the number of ways for each of the edges, I mean, for each pair of x, y. It's a number of ways of choosing n, x, y edges among the n, x, y. Multiply on everything. So this is exactly the number of n included in m with nxy exits between x and y for every x and y. It's exactly this number. But now you start to understand what are the quantities upstairs. This quantity is what? This is the number of n included in m such that the sources of n is b, where here the sources of a graph is just a, a set of edges of vertices with odd degree. This is a natural generalization for the thing for currents. So this is just the number of uh, n included in actually m restricted to h, such that boundary of n is, a, is b. And the guy on the right is the number of n included in mh, m restricted to h, such that the sources, I mean, you have no sources. And you would like to be proving that this is equal when you add indicator that m belong to fb. Right? That's what you want to prove. You want to prove that if I take a current in fb, then if I interpret it as a multigraph, the number of ways of finding a subgraph with sources b is the same as the number of ways of finding a subgraph with no sources. But now you are in very, very good shape. Why? I mean, first thing maybe. Notice that if you find even a single n that satisfies this, if you look at the multiplicity of n, you will find a k which exactly has sources b and which is smaller than m. So you will exactly prove that m restricted, uh, m restricted to h. Sorry. you will exactly prove that m restricted to h belong to fb. So already if, so maybe that's the simplest thing, if um, there, there doesn't exist n, or let's call it k, such inclu included in mh such that the boundary of k is equal to b, then there cannot exists k such that k is smaller than mh and boundary of k equal b and vice versa.
If there exists one, then there exists a k. So maybe I should write it like that. There exists k such that blah blah, if and only if there, uh, there exists k such that simply in one case you take the number of edges, and in the other case, if there is a k, then you can find a graph. So already these two quantities are non zero at the same time. Now, why, when they are non-zero, they are actually equal? Well, they are equal because, in fact, there is a mapping between this and this. If there is k, then if you take the symmetric difference of a current of a n with k, you exactly map this to this. So now, if there exists k uh, included in MH such that the boundary of k is B, then N maps to N symmetric difference with K is an involution between the two sets. So they have same cardinality. So if there isn't any set, then both quantities are 0. If there is a k, then both, qu both quantities are equal because there is a bijection between the two sets that you are counting, this set and this set. I see that some people don't look convinced. Is there a question on this? Did I forget something? Maybe I did, I don't know. But uh, yeah, so it's a quite cool and short combinatorial argument at the end. Okay, so let's go to applications of that. So as I said, and this one I even described it before, so if I look at sigma, remember sigma a is a product for x in a of sigma x. So imagine I look at sigma a times sigma b. So this can be written, if I use the currents, here there are going to be two currents with no sources. And here there is going to be one current with sources A and one current with sources B, WN1, WN2. OK? So if I use the switching, I can put B sources on A, and I end up with some with N1 sources A diff symmetric difference with B, N2 with no sources. Downstairs, I still have no sources. And here, the only thing I must add is indicator that N1 plus N2 belongs to FB. But the good thing about that is that I can drop, if I drop the indicator function, then I'm only increasing my quantity. And as soon as I did that, I can drop the n2 because it appears at the top and bottom. And what do I see? I see the sum of a current with sources asymmetric difference with b divided by the sourceless currents. This is exactly sigma a sigma b. I mean, it's sigma a symmetric difference with b, which is just sigma a sigma b. OK? In fact, you could even not drop anything, because it quantifies, in some sense, how much smaller sigma a sigma b is compared to the correlation of sigma a sigma b. Imagine, so define P A of G. So the probability of a current to be 1 over Z A G. So remember, this is a source, I mean, the sum over currents with sources A. 
times W beta of n indicate that the boundary of n is equal to a. Define that. It's a probability measure, because if you sum on the guy on the top, you get exactly this. And it's just telling you it's a, a probability measure that is sampling a current with sources A with probability proportional to the weight of the current. Kind of the most natural thing you can uh, define. If I use that, then, for instance, sigma A, sigma B, uh, sigma A times sigma B, I mean the correlation of sigma A times the correlation of sigma B, I can rewrite them if I go there and instead of erasing, I just divide and multiply by z a symmetric difference with b. What do I end up with? I end up exactly with the fact that this is sigma a sigma b times the probability for one current sampled according to this measure, a second current sample with no sources, it's N2 here, I sample it with no sources, and I look at the probability that N1 plus N2 belongs to FB. This is just Another way of putting it, it becomes clear that sigma a, the product of the spin spin is smaller than the spin spin of the product, I mean the correlations of the product, because the probability is always smaller than one. But it actually gives you by how much. You have an explicit expression for that. Here, by the way, this is a, that means a product measure. Huh? And because for some reason you are going to see this is going to appear more and more. In fact, we are going to use a simpler notation when I have PGA1, PGA2, etc. So if I'm looking at the product measure of several of these guys, I would just denote it by P, A1, A2, etc., AK. But you have to remember, it means sampling the currents independently. OK. So let me give you other applications. Like that, you will become a master in the switching lemma. So I'm not going to erase the switching lemma. <laughs> So if, for instance, I look at sigma a h, and I look at h included in g, so let's say this was the first application. Now I look at the second one. And I want to compare that to sigma a on g, OK? So I look, this is Z A H over Z empty set H. And here what I can do is I can just add on both sides the partition function on G. But now here, I think I have my first current which is sourceless on G, my second current which has sources A on H. I'm allowed to switch the sources from the second current to the first one. So this is the same as, I'm going to keep this thing. And here I'm going to now have sources, so N1 with sources A, N2 on the smaller thing with no sources, WN1, WN2. And here I get indicator that N1 plus N2, restricted to H, belongs to FA. I just switch the sources. And here again, I can try to make a probability appear. So what type of probability can I uh, 
make a pier like that. So here, second current on H, it's perfect, it appears here, sourceless current. So this thing is exactly the probability of the second current. So the only thing I need to do is to make here a probability appear. So what do I do? I multiply by ZAG. Oh, this probably well, okay. And divide by ZAG. Because now, what do I see? Here I have sigma A G, and then I have probability for a first current sample on G with sources A, a second current sample on edge with no sources, and I want that N1 plus N2 belongs to F restricted to H. So, uh, 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 sorry, that made no sense, to FA. So again, I get, for instance, immediately that spin-spin correlations are increasing in the graph. But in addition, I, I know by how much. This can be actually very useful if you want, for instance, to be comparing plus boundary condition to zero boundary condition, because plus boundary condition can be interpreted as the easing model on the graph plus what we call a ghost vertex. I will not go into detail there. But then it corresponds to comparing the spin-spin with this ghost vertex to the spin-spin without this ghost vertex, and you have a clean graphical representation of the difference between the two. So it's very, very useful when you try to prove, for instance, mixing properties. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, so in, it looks like the sum um, of n1 is over n to the e of h instead of... Um, instead of uh, so you, sorry, here? Yeah, it should be, should be h or... Yeah, uh, sorry, here it's h, and I use the switching. You switching, okay. So either you say, so, okay, let me rewrite the... Um, if you say here, if you write what you are saying, indeed it's something like 1 over z empty set h, z empty set g, and it's a sum wn1, wn2. And here indeed you want to say n1 is on h, I mean n2 is on, I mean n1 is on g but with source less currents, and N2 is on H, with sources A. And I, s but here there is no indicator, right? And I switch the sources by introducing this term. I see that I lost you, so let me try to, uh, this thing, is exactly your sigma a h, right? And I added, artificially if you want, a second current, or if you want a first current in this case, and then I switch. So, I mean, of course you want to be using the switching lemma, so you systematically, in some sense, add a second current artificially. There are, there are two cases, so either you already have a product, and when you have a product, in some sense, you get, in, you get very naturally two currents. Sometimes you want to be comparing quantities that have only one, one quantity, which in some sense corresponds to one current. So then in this case, you add artificially a second one. I want to be taking time on this. I know it's, I mean, first, it's not really pushing us away from the ultimate goal, because I'm actually giving you quantities that are not irrelevant for the, <laughs> the full proof of the, of the triviality, but also, I mean, this is such a powerful tool that I think it's useful to be discussing it. So let me give you a third application, which is called the simon lieb inequality. And which is maybe the first kind of 
clear connection between easing and random walks. And people forget it quite often. So it says the following. Take a set S and a point 0 in it, and take x, which is not in S. OK? I claim that sigma 0, sigma x in G is smaller or equal to the sum for y on the boundary of S, meaning really here of sigma 0, sigma y. But when I look at the easing model on the graph s only, times sigma y, sigma x on g. Why do I say this is a connection to random walk? If you think of the green function of the random walk, and you decompose the random walk, so green function is expected number of visits here for a random walk starting from here. If I decompose the random walk on the first exit time, so I stop it the first time, then what do I get? I get that sigma 0, sigma x is an average on the probability of exiting s somewhere at, at a given point, times now where the expected number of visits here starting from this point. So this is. If you interpret this as a green function, you recover exactly the green function starting from y here. And this is where that should be interpreted as a green function in S. But this is clearly like the expected number of visits of y starting from 0 when you look at random work in S is clearly larger than the probability that you exit S through y. So it's really what you get. It's exactly what you get for random walk. It's something that you get from the Markov property in random walks. There is another model that has this property. And it's Bernoulli percolation, for people who know. So it's exactly using the BK inequality, or we actually doing it by hand, something saying the probability that 0 is connected to x is smaller than the sum of the points on the boundary, probability that 0 is connected to y in s, times probability that y is connected to x. And this, so easing, percolation, and random walks are really actually self-holding walk also satisfies these things. They are really processes for which there are special proof, for instance, of exponential decay and things like that. They, that's what they share. It's this kind of random walk inequality that you have. So how do we get it out of the random current? By the way, this is maybe not that easy to get without the random current, but with the random current, it's quite straightforward. So, yeah? Can you see again why it's, it's less or equal, not equal? Um, so for random work, it's equal if you replace this by pro exit probability. Already, if you replace it by expected number of visits, you lose something. So it's only an inequality anymore. It's a question, basically, it's an inequality because here it's kind of looks doing a union bound. Like instead of saying there exists a place where you exit, you bound it by then it's a sum over the points of probability of exiting through this point. And because it's not exactly probability of exiting, but number of visits, you lose something. You the Sorry? Not yeah, exactly. When, when, when you look at the picture, it looks good because there is a unique exit point. And for random work, you can cook up a slightly modified version of this by looking, I mean, by replacing this by probability of touching the boundary at y, and there it's an equality. But of course, this is only a, a, a caricature of what happens for easing. Easing doesn't have this mark of property, so it's going to be an inequality. And we will see, actually, in the formula, you will see where uh, you get an inequality. OK. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, so I don't know if it's relevant, but could you get an equality by doing some kind of inclusion-exclusion principle? I mean, we will get an equality with a certain probability thing, and okay. then we will do a union bond. But I mean, if you don't do the union bond, you will get something where you get an equality. So here, so the idea is going to be to, so again, it's the same trick as here. We have only one guy, and we would like to cook up two, especially that here we have product of spin spin. So 
here it's this thing, right? This is exactly our spin spin. So I'm going to add artificially the empty set S. Okay. So it's one over the empty set G, the empty set S. And here I get some. So N1 is on G and has sources 0x. And N2 is on H, uh, is on S, sorry, and has sources empty set. OK? Up to now, it's an equality. But here is the inequality, and indeed, you could do something smarter if you want to keep something sharper. But by the way, I don't know any application where somebody is doing something sharper. Well, OK, no, let me rephrase. There is a very important application, but I don't want to talk about, you <laughs> about it here because it's some ongoing project. But in high dimension, you can improve on that, and it's important. Um, so I'm going to do an inequality by just observing that if there is a source from 0 to x, then necessarily there is y on the boundary of s such that n1 plus n2 restricted to s, I mean, such that if you want, uh, 0 is connected to y in n1 plus n2 restricted to s. It's just trivial. Because even in the first current, there is already a path from 0 to x, so there is already a y on the boundary which is connected. So a fortiori in the sum of the two currents. So this, I mean, maybe this an, a better way to write it is maybe saying that this is n1 plus n2 restricted to s belongs to f 0 y. <coughs> but that's perfect because this is exactly the thing that you are allowing, I mean, this is exactly the thing you need to be allowed to switch the sources. This time in the other way. Usually we add the indicator. Here we are going to remove it. So if we remove it, let me invert just the two sums. So now I have WN1, WA2 indicator of N1 plus N2 belongs to F0Y. So I'm allowed to switch 0Y on both sides. So that gives me N1 with sources 0x symmetric difference with 0y, which is xy. And N2 with sources 0y. Right? If I take this and I switch 0y, I exactly end up with this, this term. OK. Well, now what do I see? This give me sigma x, sigma y in G. And this give me sigma 0, sigma y in S. So once you know the switching lemma, you really get Simon Lieb in, uh, I mean, I didn't lie, in, in two lines. And if I would have had a bigger board in one line. OK, just for your culture, I want to mention one thing. One thing which is true for raising and wrong for many, many uh, quantities is that if you take beta, uh, so define phi beta of s to be the sum 
for x on the boundary of s of sigma 0, sigma x, s. OK? It's ex I mean, or I could have let me write y just to, to be more coherent with what is above. So it's exactly this quantity here. OK? Notice that if phi beta of s is smaller than 1 strictly, then sigma 0, sigma x, g is smaller or equal to phi beta. I mean, actually, it's always true, so maybe I should not, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, OK. Phi beta of s to the x over radius of s, simply because what I can do is I can, uh, pr uh, for every x, not in s. Why? Because so radius is just, right? I mean, the max distance between a point in s and uh, 0. Why? Because whatever the point I take, when I can apply my simon lieb inequality on s centered at 0, but now for sigma y, sigma x, I can apply the simon lieb inequality centered, uh, I mean, by uh, looking at the translate of s around y. And I can keep going like that. Let's say I exit here. And because I can apply it at least x over radius of s times before I reach x, I'm certain to have this inequality. But if phi beta of s is smaller than 1, what does it tell me? It gives me automatically exponential decay of correlations for sigma 0, sigma x. So if phi beta of s is smaller than 1, then you have that. And in particular, correlations decay exponentially fast. So in particular, what do I learn on beta? Well, beta then must be smaller than beta critical. Here, I mean, smaller or equal, at least, because above criticality, they don't even decay when you take g to be zd. But in fact, even at criticality. Why? Because if this is strictly smaller than 1, you are on a finite set S, you can increase a little bit beta and still get something smaller than 1. So this will be contradictory with the fact that you are exactly at beta C, because you will get exponential decay a little bit above it. OK? So this is an open condition, if you want. There exists, there exists S finite so that you have this is an open condition. So it cannot be, and it's included in 0 beta c, so it cannot uh, be more than the open set 0 beta c. But that tells you one interesting thing is that phi beta c of s is larger or equal to 1 for every s finite containing 0. It's a very strong inequality. And in fact, it's a characterization of the critical point, And it's a cool characterization. You can use this to prove, for instance, sharpness, meaning exponential decay, as soon as beta is smaller than beta c. And another thing you can do for the physicist in the room is that you can look at the susceptibility of your model, which is the sum of the correlations. Well, chi of beta c is larger or equal to the sum for n equal 1 to infinity of phi beta c of lambda n. If I take boxes like that, the correlation 
between 0 and x in the full plane is larger than the correlation in the box lambda n. So you can write this by monotonicity. But I just told you that phi beta c of s was always larger or equal to 1. So what it gives me automatically is that this is always larger or equal to 1. So it tells me that the susceptibility of the easing model is always infinite at the critical point, which is a strong indication of continuity of the phase transition. It's actually one has to be very careful because that's not equivalent. In fact, you can look at the easing model with long range interaction 1 over x minus y squared in 1D, which exactly satisfies this because here there is nothing special about nearest neighbor. So it has infinite susceptibility, but still positive spontaneous magnetization. But at least physically, let's say that if the correlation lengths explode, it's a very strong indication. And if the susceptibility explodes when beta tends to beta c from below, it's a strong indication that you have a continuous phase transition when the model is not too weird. So that's why I wanted to mention that. that does it give a good uh, estimate of, uh, on the, of the susceptibility on the box or how it goes? So, so it gives you that sigma 0, sigma x is roughly at least like 1 over x to the d minus 1, right? Because mm -hmm. you have roughly n to the d minus 1 points at distance n. So it gives you this bond. We will see that you get the infrared bond on the other side that gives you smaller or equal to 1 over n to the d minus 2. Mm -hmm. So you can sandwich the spin-spin correlation between these two values. And let's face it, this is not a very good lower bound. Because in dimension 4 and more, you expect actually exactly to have behavior 1 over n to the d minus 2. So you are actually uh, equal to the top one. And in dimension 3, the current estimates are that you get like uh, exponent 1.03 or 01. I never remember, but it's extremely close actually to 1 over n to the d minus 2. So it doesn't give a good lower bound, but yeah, it still gives a polynomial lower bound, which is, as, as a probabilist, you are always happy with this type of thing. OK. Before I get, and actually it will be a good, uh, uh, we are going to make a smaller, I mean, a break, which is a little bit uh, earlier, but, uh, early, sorry. But let me mention uh, one. So actually, I'm going to mention what you just uh, asked. So in particular, the max for of, of the sigma 0, sigma x, beta c, for x on the boundary of lambda n, this is larger than 1 over volume of lambda n. It's, yeah, this is a polynomial lower bound. Let me mention, and this is a cool exercise, but I will not do it here, but for your culture, yet another inequality of the easing model. So this is the fourth application, something like that. It's called the messager miracle solé inequality. And it says the following. If you take 0 and you take either a, horizontal, a vertical line like that, or a diagonal one. Like so either it's x equal y plus constant, or uh, y equal constant, or actually x equal constant also works. But I mean, this is pretty oh, OK. And it says the following. Let's say I take a point. So let, let, let me draw it with this, but then it will be obvious what, it is, what I mean for the others. Let's take a point x on this side of the line and define tau x to be the reflection with respect to this line. Well, sigma 0, sigma x is always larger or equal to sigma 0, sigma tau x. OK, why is it good? Because in particular, you can check that, so this is true for vertical lines. So uh, if you want in higher dimension hyperplanes along one coordinate, it's also true for diagonal hyperplanes. So in particular, 
it, it implies something that is extremely natural from the point of view of physics, but which is not at all obvious when you look at a lattice model. It implies something like sigma 0, sigma x is always larger than sigma 0, sigma y if y is larger than d tan x, something like that. In, if the distance between y and the origin is at least d times the distance between x and the origin. So it allows you to tell something completely obvious that if I take a point constant distance farther than you, the spin spin is smaller. Of course, if you are a physicist, you will say, well, I mean, there is a scaling hypothesis or something like that. So then it's completely obvious. But I mean, when you are not, you don't have the scaling hypothesis at your disposal, it's not that clear that things are, are decreasing. In fact, this type of questions are completely open, for instance, for, I mean, basically for every other model like Bernoulli percolation or uh, FK percolation. It's, it's, it's not something uh, obvious. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes. For this inequality, are, are, are the horizontal and the vertical line arbitrary or? Yeah, you can take any horizontal line, any vertical line. That's your question? I mean, you will need, you will need that it has this type of, I mean, either like that or diagonal. It's going to be clear in a minute. So how do you prove that? Just I mention it and I don't do it. What you do is that, again, you try to have n1 and n2, two currents. But here the trick is not to take two independent currents. It's to take one current in the plane and to fold it. So n2, so you are going to have n1, which is the part of the current here, and n2 is going to be the reflected version. This is tau of n2 in some sense. It's a reflective version of this current. You fold like that, like you fold your page into two. Why is it not that stupid to do that? Is that notice that if you have 0x, then the sources of n1 plus n2 is 0 and x, right? But if you have 0 and tau x, then the sources of n1 plus n2 are still 0 and x because I folded the second current. And then what happens is that, in fact, you will notice that this sigma 0, sigma tau x, for this folded current, it corresponds to 0 connected to the boundary of your half plane. So it has sources 0 and x, but it must there must be a path. So now I'm in a half plane, if you want. I have n1 plus n2. I have 0 and x. And in some sense, I must, in this case, I must have a path that is connected to the boundary, because in the original thing, they must have the path from 0 to tau x. So when I, uh, I fold, this path doesn't disappear. And that is the difference that this is smaller than this, because there is this additional condition on the, there is no reason a priori to have a pass from 0 to, uh, to the boundary. It could just be that 0 is connected to x without connected, being connected to the boundary. So I mean, I let you look at the details. It's a cool exercise. And um, again, it quantifies also a little bit this. So you can, for instance, try to interpret the gradient of the spin-spin correlation in this way to try to understand that it becomes like x is just next to the boundary. It's connected. I mean, the different the gradient will be 0 is connected to x, but not to the boundary. So it makes a half plane, a half space exponent appear. I mean, there are really some cool interpretations. OK, <coughs> let's make a short break. I mean, a 10 minutes break. And then we restart with uh, this time trying to quantify like how close you are from Vick's, Vick's rule. So we are uh, here I gave you a lot of examples of manipulations we can make. Now we are going to focus on the one that we are interested in, which is trying to quantify how good Vick's rule is for the easing model. And we are going to see some nice quantities appearing. OK, good. OK, so new part of the, pr of, of the class. Let's try now to look at two endpoint correlations and see how close they are from the VIG product. So 2.3, quantifying, maybe I should put, so quantifying VIG slope. 
for easing, meaning quantifying how close it is to be true. And um, we are going to start, so the question is how close how close sigma x1 sigma x2n and g 2n x1 x2n which by definition is the sum of a pairings pi of the product for i equal to 1 to n of sigma x pi 2i minus 1 sigma x pi 2i. So you take a pairing. How close these quantities are when mutual distances go to infinity. Okay, that's going to be the game. Okay, more, let me keep that. And as a starter, so I'm going to do it completely. Usually I only do the four point function, but actually I think we have time to the, do the two end point function and then next week to, uh, to really do a full proof of the triviality under a certain assumption. So step one, let's do the four point function the four-point case. So in this case, we look at u4 beta of x1, x4, which is sigma x1, sigma x4. And we subtract g4 of x1, x4. And my goal is to know how small, I mean, to get how small this is. OK, so let me start by not a fail attempt, but like something which is good, but not optimal. So let's look at. So it's proposition something like 2.9, I think. It's going to be a backbone representation. So I'm going to try to express, a, I mean, to get a bound on that using the backbone. OK, and the bound is saying the following. It's saying that 0 is larger than u4, which is larger, OK, maybe let me put 0 is less or equal to minus, uh, yeah, minus u4, <laughs> which is, so u4 is always negative. And this is smaller than v4, which is the sum of the following. So it's the sum over i j and k, which is just 2, 3, 4, okay, of sigma x1, sigma xi, sigma xj, sigma xk. So this is exactly, if, if I stop here, this will be exactly the g4. But I'm adding probability right. or maybe, yeah, maybe let me write it like, uh, no, I'm going to write it in a non-normalized way, otherwise it's going to be the end. <laughs> Sum on gamma 1, which goes to from x1 to xi and gamma 2, which goes from xj to, X, uh, to xk. So I have x1, x2, 
to x3 and x4, and I'm going to look at one pass for in from x1 to x xi, and one from xj to xl. And here I'm going to put rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma 2. So this is exactly taking two backbones and looking at indicator that gamma 1 is not intersecting gamma 2. Uh, is intersecting gamma 2, sorry. So I can bound u4 using, in some sense, something like the probability that if I sample a backbone from x1 to xi and a backbone from xj to xl, I, uh, they intersect. OK? OK, don't worry if you don't quite understand too much what I'm doing. Anyway, this will not be the, ob the object we will work with. We will have a better expression using the double random current. So, let's try still to prove this. So remember, this is a sum of a gamma backbone connecting one, I mean x1, x4 of rho of gamma, right? This was the expression sigma a is the sum of the weights of a backbones, right? Pairing the thing. And here, if I look at the backbone that is pairing the four points, automatically, let's say, I, let's say the backbones are started from x1. They are going to connect to one of the three guys, and then there will be a second pass connecting to the second guy. So I'm going to write this as sum of a gamma 1 that goes from x1 to sum xi, and gamma 2 that goes from xj to xl, uh, xk. Okay? Except now rho of gamma, this is rho of gamma 1 times rho gamma 2, uh, gamma 1 bar of gamma 2. This was the chain rule, right? The weight, if gamma is a concatenation of two backbones, then I can express the weight of gamma in terms of the weight of the two backbones, except that for the second backbone, I'm looking at the weight in the depleted graph where I remove the first backbone and actually a little bit more around it all these points for which I know it's even. OK, first observation is that here, so uh, left inequality, if I just sum, I fix gamma 1 and I sum on the gamma 2, then I get sum from gamma 1 from x1 to xi, rho of gamma 1, and then I get sigma xj, sigma xk, in the graph g minus gamma 1 bar. It's exactly what it corresponds to. I'm summing all the backbone from xj to xk, just in the smaller graph. So I get the spin spin in the smaller graph. But we saw earlier, actually, brilliant pedagogical uh, presentation. I know there is monotonicity in the graph. Therefore, I can remove this. And as soon as I remove this, here, this becomes decorrelated from this. And this is just sigma x1, sigma xi. So I get sum over the possible i of the product. So the four-point function is smaller or equal to the g4. Uh, so sigma x1, sigma x4 is smaller or equal to g4 of x1, x4. By the way, so and therefore u4 is negative. This is called Lebovitz inequality. Now let's look at the right inequality. <laughs> 
for the right inequality, well, things are not much worse if gamma 1 and gamma 2 do not intersect. Then we saw that rho gamma 1 bar of gamma 2 was in fact larger or equal to rho, rho gamma 2. So that implies that sigma 1, sigma x1, sigma x4 is in fact larger or equal to the sum of a gamma 1 connecting x1 to xi, gamma 2 connected xj to xk, of rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma 2. So here you feel, oh, well, I got exactly what I wanted. I got g4, so I mean, what is wrong? Well, it's just that before, when I was writing rho gamma 2 of gamma 1 bar, in some sense, there was something implicit here, which was that gamma 2 and gamma 1 should not intersect. Because otherwise, in some sense, you set the weight to be 0, if you prefer. So here, I need to add gamma 1 intersected gamma 2 is is empty, the intersection is empty because otherwise I lost too much if you want. If the two guys do not intersect, I, I can put the inequality. Otherwise, I get zero. So I need to put this. But now you exactly saw that, I mean, this is g4 x1 x4 minus the same sum with the intersection. Voilà. OK? So at this stage already, there is something very clear that should appear in your brain. So there is a random walk interpretation of uh, u4. If you don't have this indicator function, you get g4. So now, if I imagine that I sample at random rho 1 and rho 2 with probabilities that are proportional to their backbone weight, then what am, what am I doing? I'm sampling two independent backbones, if you want, one pairing x1 and xi, one pairing xj and XL, uh, xk, and I'm looking at whether they intersect with good probability or not. Now, if I ask the same question for random walk, I take two points, I mean four points, and I sample a random walk from their condition on ending there, and a random walk from here condition on ending there and I look at whether they intersect or not. So this is now random walk probabilities. Um. These things are going to behave very differently depending on the dimension. In dimension d smaller or equal to, I mean, strictly smaller than 4, this remains larger than constant. In, in 2D, it's kind of clear. You have your first, first kind of path from x1 to x2, and the second one, it's kind of non-degenerate, so they have a positive proportion to cross. In 2D, it's clear. In 3D, it's still actually true. It's a little bit less clear, but actually it's not a difficult theorem at all, and it is, uh, it is still true. In dimension d larger than 4, in fact, it decays if I take points at mutual distance l of each other, it decays like 1 over l to the d minus 4. So random walks in dimension 5 and more, and in fact, if you take long range random walks in any effective dimension larger than 4, they, they will actually intersect with probability tending to 0 when the distance goes to infinity. And in fact, in dimension 4, it's a little bit more subtle, but it's also true. It should decay like 1 over log L. 
So now what does it tell me? It tells me that when I'm comparing u4 to g4, well, in dimension 4 and more, if I believe that my backbones behave like random walk, then I should get a factor tending to 0 in front. So u4 should be much smaller than uh, g4, or equivalently sigma 1, sigma 4. Of course, the very big caveat here is that this random walk, I mean, these backbones, they do not behave like random walk, a priori. In fact, in dimension 3 and, and, and less, they do not behave at all like random walk. They are much more like self avoiding walk type objects. So, I mean, we are going to have to do something to kind of compare the behavior of these backbones to random walk. But if you believe that in dimension 4 and more they behave like random walk, then you have a very good heuristic singling out 4 as a critical dimension. OK? OK. Let me mention now a slight improvement on this. It's going to be important because that's the one that works in dimension 4. And also it will lead, it will help getting the higher, like the, what you get in, um, for two endpoints. OK, so proposition 2.10. So here it was a, a backbone representation. So let's now get a double random current representation. And it says the following, u4 beta, or if you want minus u4, or u4, is minus 2 sigma x1 sigma x4 times probability for one current with sources x1 to x4 and one sourceless current of x1 x4 all connected in n1 plus n2. Meaning that I can find for any two points, I can find the, I mean, that all these points are connected by paths of positive current. And actually, another way of writing it, just I put it here. I can also just keep sources a little bit more balanced. Here I put all the sources on the first guy. I could also keep them on both sides and ask the same events. So the advantage of this representation with respect to the previous one is that, as you noticed, it's an equality. OK. And the proof, as often with the random current, is going to be straightforward. If I look at sigma x1, sigma x4, and I subtract sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, minus and minus. So this, right, is z x1 to x4 over z empty set minus zx1, x2, zx3, x4 over z empty set, z empty set, minus, minus, right? And as usual, we are going to try to homogenize a little bit. I'm going to put z empty set here and z empty set here, OK? To have two currents also for the first one. And now notice what? I'm not even going to write these big sums anymore. You are specialists now. So here, I have one current with sources x1, x2, and one current with sources x3, x4. 
if I switch devices, this is my second current, and I switch the sources x1, x2 to the first one, I'm going to get empty set, or let me write it below. So here I get the same thing. I'm going to get z x1, x4. Z empty, or, or I'm going to get, let me put it like that, sorry. Sum over n1, which sources x1, x4. And here I switch sources x1, x2 to the first current. So I'm going to get indicator that x1 is connected to x2 in n1 plus n2. And I can do the same for the others. So eventually, what do I get? Here I can make the sigma x1, sigma x4 appear as usual. Look at the probability. So this is always like adding and subtracting z x1, x4. I get probability x1, x4, empty set. For the first term, I get 1. There is no condition. For the second one, I get indicator function that x1 is connected to x2 in n1 plus n2. For the third one, it's going to be switching x1 and x3 with the thing. So I get x1 connected to x3. And for the fourth one, it would be x1 and x4 that I switch. So I get this. But notice now. You have four sources. You are at least pairing the sources. So what are the possibilities? Either x1 is connected to one person or to everybody. If it's connected to one person, then one of these indicator function exactly pops up and is equal to one. The two others are equal to zero. So I get zero. Or they are connected to everybody. In this case, these three indicator functions are equal to one, and I get minus two. So this is a very complicated way under the source constraint that you need to pair x1 to x4. It's a complicated way of just writing minus 2 indicator function that everybody is connected. Okay? As soon as everybody is connected, in fact, you could also switch back sources x1, x2 to the, next, to the second guy, and you will get the second expression. Because this x1 and uh, I mean, if they are all connected, then you can switch any source you want. So this this is just minus two indicator function of x1, x4 all connected. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, if x1 is equal to x2, this equality becomes trivial or...? Oh, you, you are right. I mean, sorry, I should take this disjoint point. It's actually very good. I, I'm so much having in mind that we are going to let the distance go to infinity that I didn't even mention that, but you are entirely right. I mean... Very good. Very, very good. So the notation there is for the product law? Sorry? The P with H1, H4 and the empty cell is the product law? Like yeah, 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 it's this P. Uh, yeah, here I wrote it like that. I should, uh, because here I wanted to be careful that it's not the same graphs and I didn't introduce the notation for that. That's all. But when they are the same graph, I will always use the comma. But you are right, it's a product measure. It's just that very soon we are going to have four currents. So if we, this is three crosses and three additional Ps, and you know, my, uh, I'm getting old, so I need to be careful with my <laughs> rest. Anyway, um, just I'm going to keep the tree diagram burned for next week, I think. And uh, just a small remark. Let's, let's write a small remark after this. You have to respect the switching lemma. Nobody will erase the switching lemma. You should repeat after me, normally. <laughs> anyway, uh, OK, just a remark.
how bad was the estimate with V4? It was a bound. How bad is it? It's not a bad bound. So let me mention that, in fact, minus U4 is also larger or equal to 2 thirds of V4. So up to constant V4 is actually a good uh, estimate. And in order to see that, it's kind of a little bit, we know now what this is, right? This is one half, I mean, this is twice. So uh, sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, times probability x1, x2, x3, x4, of uh, x1, everybody, x4, all connected. Right? This is u4. It's one, is, and this is true for uh, any permutation of 2, 3, 4. But notice that this, in fact, is clearly larger, or, I mean, sorry, this whole thing here is larger or equal to sum of a gamma 1 from x1 to x2 and gamma 2 from x3 to x4 of uh, rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma 2, indicator than gamma 1 and gamma 2 intersect. Why is it true? This is just sigma x1, sigma x2, times sigma x3, sigma x4, times the probability that the backbone intersect. It's actually exactly what this is. If the backbone intersect, obviously, x1 and x4 are all connected in the sum of the two currents. It's not an equality because you could imagine that the backbone do like that, and that it's a loop, or even, uh, 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 let's say, the backbones, so let, let me write them like that. These are the backbones. But you could imagine that there is a loop of the first current that connects to a loop of the second current, that connects to a loop of the third current, that connects to the loop of the first current, to end up with everybody connected. So it's not an equality, but clearly there is an inequality between the two. OK? OK, so that means that minus u4 is larger than twice this. But this is true for any choice of, I mean, any permutation of x2, x3, x4. So 3 times u4 is larger than twice the sum over uh, gamma 1 from x1 to xi, gamma 2 from xj to xk, of rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma 2, indicator of gamma 1 and gamma 2 do not intersect, which was exactly uh, v4. So 3 times u4 is larger than twice v4. OK? So true for permutation for the 3 permutation of x2, x3, x4. And then you get that minus 3 u4 is larger than 2 v4. OK? So at least you are up to constant v4 was actually a good approximation. But with a double random current, you get an equality. OK. OK. Well, we are getting closer to the end of this class, but also to, to the juice. Um, so let's just mention uh, uh, step two, case of two endpoints. This is going to be important because when we are going to try to prove Gaussianity, in particular when we are going to express the characteristic function of our random variable. I mean, how will we will express it? We will just expand, and then we will have two endpoint correlation that appears. So there, the proposition, 2.11, is the following, is that G2n is lo always larger than S2n. So S2n is just, sig or, or let me, sigma x1. Sigma, uh, well, let's, let me call it S2n. So S2n of x1, x2n is sigma x1, sigma x2n. 
Okay, it's uh, just uh, the Schwinger. I mean, I'm using the Schwinger, Schwinger notation. Actually, I didn't need it. I don't know why I did that. Uh, no, okay, let me not do it. Sorry. I thought I needed it, but I don't. So, so I have a bound like that, which sometimes is referred to as the Gaussian bound. So, the spin-spin correlation are always smaller than the sum. Of um, of the pairing, so what is given by Fick law, and again here you want to be expressing it in the other direction. So you would like exactly equal to g to n, but you are going to get something a little bit weaker. And this something is going to be the following. I need to take four points out, and what I get is g to n minus four of x one xi, when I remove xi, xj, xk, xl, I think the notation is pretty self-explanatory. You just remove the four points and you look at the core, I mean at the Vic law. And here I get u4 of xi, xj, xk, xl. And there is a three half that got lost somewhere. Let me put it in front. So why is this proposition nice? Well, it's quite nice because it tells you you only need, in some sense, to treat u4, and then you will get an estimate for everybody. So at least next week, we, uh, I mean tomorrow, we will just focus on the four-point function. OK. Let's prove this. It's not that complicated. OK, so the first thing is that G2n, re I mean, a, a way of writing G2n is just to say, well, it's a collection of 2n, I mean, of n path pairing x1 to, I mean, x pi, uh, pi 1 to x pi 2, x pi 3 to x pi 3, x, uh, pi 4, etc., of rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma n. It's just a way. I mean, I mean, so pairing the xi. This is g to n. Sigma x one, sigma x two n is what? It's just a sum on gamma one, gamma n pairing the xi, but this time it's rho of gamma one, rho gamma one bar of gamma two rho gamma 1 concatenated with gamma 2 bar of gamma 3, etc. I remember now this thing. I forgot about it, but now I remember. You know how my end will come. One day I will just... I didn't remember how maddening this noise was, but... Um, okay. This is S2n. Uh, this is sigma 1, sigma 2n. It's complicated a priori, but this is. Um, OK. G2n larger or equal to sigma x1, sigma x2n follows, well, exactly from the same argument as for four points. What did we do? We were just summing, I mean, fixing gamma 1 to gamma n minus 1, summing over the gamma n. We were getting sigma x pi to n minus 1, sigma x pi to n in the smaller graph where you remove these guys. And by Griffith, I mean, by the inequality, the increasing in the graph, it's smaller than sigma uh, x uh, to pi, uh, pi to n minus 1, sigma x pi to n. So this, is, this follows from the same proof. as for n equal four, uh, 2. So what is truly interesting is the other one. And the other one is going to be again, let me write it like that, the same trick. If I look at something like that, it's larger or equal to what I get uh, in, the, um, in the guy uh, without the, the thing. So here I can 
I mean, where I'm not looking at depleted. So I can sum over gamma 1, gamma n, rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma n. And the only thing is that there is an indicator function that the gamma 1, gamma n do not intersect. OK? Well, again, write this as 1 minus sum over, let's say, uh, r and s of rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma n, indicator than gamma r intersect gamma s. It's clearly a lower bound. Right? I should have indicator that nobody intersects. Well, it's 1 minus probability that they intersect. This is 1 minus the expected number of intersection, if you want, of pairs of guys that intersect. OK, but here now, what do you see? If you look at gamma r and gamma s, you see rho of gamma r, rho of gamma s times the indicator function that they intersect. This was exactly v4. So here, let me write it upstairs. So this is now sum over uh, i smaller than j smaller than k smaller than l. These are going to be exactly the points that are um, paired by uh, gamma r and gamma s. And then I will get sum over gamma 1, gamma r hat, gamma s hat, gamma n, rho of gamma 1, rho of gamma n. And again, there is no, uh, I mean, I think you, you understood what I mean. And here there is sum of rho of gamma r, rho of gamma s, indicator that gamma r is intersecting with gamma s. This is v4. So here, if I should be careful, I should sum. I mean, OK, maybe let me add. Well, yeah, I mean, OK. It's v4 of the points that are paired like that. And this is exactly g2n minus 4 of the points that are not paired by uh, gamma r and gamma s. Okay, And the only thing that remains is to just see that this is smaller. So uh, we said u4 is larger than 2 thirds of v4. So v4 is smaller than 3 half of v4, of u4. Sorry. OK? So that was the end of this part. Now let me prepare the field. Maybe that's a way of, I mean, I still have seven minutes. So I'm, I'm just a little bit afraid of being lacking some time tomorrow. So let me try to start a little bit the third part of the talk, which is a conditional proof of triviality. Uh, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. So, so in the continuum limit, uh, so so this this uh, this this uh, bounds are for the for for the lattice model. But in the continuum limit, we have to rescale the spin field, right? Yeah, we will rescale the spin field. I think for for the triviality of the continu continuum limit, one has to divide the all all these quantities by g g g two n. Then, yeah. But everything is homogeneous here, right? So yeah, you divide both sides by G2. You could define a small G2n, which is a guy rescaled by uh, whatever you want. And then everything is, uh, is homogeneous. But can we still show that the remainder decays to 0 at the last distance? Yeah, 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 yeah. U4 is expressed in terms of G4, if you want. U4 is kind of G4 times a, a probability, OK? 
So if you, my point is that here, you are G2n is kind of expressed in terms of sum of G2n minus 4 times something that looks like G4. When you rescale, it's perfectly homogeneous. So the only thing you need to prove is that this is much smaller than G4. But now if you rescale G4 by what you want, you also have to rescale U4 by what you want. So the ratio of the two will not change. The only, I mean, your only problem with kind of when you, you don't know what renormalization you should put, or you, if you want to prove that any renormalization is going to give you the same result, like that you don't have a way to save yourself with a smart renormalization, is to always work with ratios. So U4 here, for instance, if you prove that U4 is much smaller than sigma x1, sigma x4, then you can rescale as you want sigma x1, sigma x4, you will have to rescale u4 also by homogeneity. So the ratio of the two will always be the same. Oh, so, so if I understand correctly, you, your conclusion is that u4 is equal to g4 times something, and there's something. Exactly. Yeah, right. I mean, that's what you get basically there. Imagine you prove the probability is small. It tells you that u4 is much smaller than sigma x1, sigma x4. Okay? u4 is actually sigma x1, sigma x4 minus something. So if you have the difference of two things, one is actually the guy on the right. I mean, the difference of two things is much smaller than this guy. But this is this one. It tells you that both guys are of the same order. Just the difference is much smaller, right? And then the ratio is, uh, yeah. So there is no problem of renormalization. Everything is homogeneous from the point of view of. Uh, OK. So, okay, let me actually not start this. Let me just mention one, one last property. I was planning to, to put it next week, but maybe, uh, I mean, tomorrow, but let me try to. So actually, there is one case where things are not that complicated. And this is something probabilists know very well is that when you are trying to estimate the probability of something, sometimes you can replace by expectation. So here we are trying to prove that there is an intersection. If in some way I can prove that the expected number of intersection is small, it's a very simple way of proving that there is no intersection. Okay? So here, it's called the tree diagram bound. And it's a way to bound u4, in some sense saying that you bound the probability of intersection by the expected number of intersection. So I just want to mention it here because we will use it tomorrow. So this is smaller than the sum for y belonging to zd of sigma x1, sigma y, sigma x4, sigma y. It's called the tree diagram bound because in some sense it looks like you have your points and you sum over y spin spin correlation. So you have this and there is a 2 here. So let me finish this class by giving you an idea of this estimate. OK. So in fact, it's not going to be difficult once you admit one bound. OK? So u4, remember, is 2 sigma x1, sigma x2, sigma x3, sigma x4, times probability x1, x2, x3, x4 of x1, x4 all connected. Or maybe another way to put is that x3 belongs to the cluster of n1 plus n2 of x1. It's a stupid way of saying, I look at the connected component, so this means the connected component, uh, sorry. The connected component of x1 in n1 plus n2, meaning all the points I can go to by only walking on edges with positive current. OK? So I have x1, I have x2. Uh, this is all the set of edges that have positive current. And I'm checking whether x3 is on it or not. And because 
I have sources x3, x4. Remember that x3 and x4 are necessarily connected. So this is another way of putting it. So here is what I will not prove. I will maybe prove it at the end tomorrow if really I have time, but this is not prioritary. Is that in fact here I can get a smaller weak equal. I can make in some sense the intersection easier by adding a current here and I think that the cluster in N3 of X3, X4 intersects the cluster of X1 in N1 percent 2. It's not that clear like that why this is true, but it's a monotonicity. So now there are three currents. The first one has sources x1, x2, the second has no sources, and the third has x3, x4. And you can check, it's, it's a kind of natural exercise in some sense. You can check that the, this is just improving your probability of intersection. Maybe if you make a drawing, It's not, maybe I can make a drawing. And then after we have that, you are going to see things are, are easy. So let's look at the probability of not intersecting. OK? So in one case, I have a backbone from x1 to x2. So if I have only two currents, so this is n1. And I have a second current. But this current is not connecting to x3. So I mean, the sum of the two currents is not connected to x3. So it looks like something like that. And in the complement of that, if, I, if you want, if I explore the whole connected component in N1 plus N2, in some sense, when I have only two currents and the second current must have sources from x3 to x4, I still need x3 to be connected to x4 in the complement. In this picture with three currents, the exact equivalent is that this current here is allowed to do whatever it wants. It's not in the complement of this first current. And in fact, the smaller the graph, the bigger the, I mean, the weight rho, you remember this weight rho of gamma, they get bigger and bigger when you take smaller and smaller graph. And in fact, when you plug here, what that means, it exactly gives you the right inequality. So it's not something super deep. It's actually fairly simple to get. But once you have that, you are done. And this is, I take you just two more minutes, and then we can all go to, uh, to T and... Uh, you can blame me for this uh, two minutes delay. Or you can blame the clock for being two minutes early. That depends. So U4, so I can bound it so I can do exactly the same thing. I'm going to rewrite the same thing. Except now I'm going to do an inequality which is even more obvious. I'm going to, so for now I had these sources. Let me add even one more current. This becomes like crazy, but let's add the fourth current and ask that the cluster of N1 percent 2 intersects the cluster of N3 percent 4. This is clearly bigger probability because I'm just making this set bigger by adding one more current. But why is it nice now? Because notice that this random variable and this one, they are independent. One depends only on the first two currents and the other one on the first, uh, on the two others. So if I now say bound, and that's what I wanted to do, from the beginning, bound this by the expected number of intersections.
right? I mean, probability of intersection is smaller than expected number of intersections. I mean, this is either zero if it do, that does not intersect, or it's larger or equal to one if it does. So it's clearly larger than this random variable. So here, I can just rewrite this as sum for y in zd of the probability that y belongs to the first cluster, which you can write as y is connected to x1 in n1 percent 2, times probability x3, x4, empty set, of y is connected to x3 in n1 percent 2. Or if you want, in n3 percent 4, depending on how it's made. OK? So what did I do? Probability of intersection, I bounded by expected number of intersections. There, it's fine. What is the expected number of intersections? It's the sum over every point of the probability that the point is in the intersection. So I write sum over every point of the probability that y is in this cluster, meaning y is connected to x1, and probability that y is connected to x3. But because things are independent, I can just split it. And now, I let you check, but the, random, the switching lemma gives you an exact formula for that. We did so many of them that now I don't have to present it anymore, but this is actually sigma x1, sigma y, sigma y, sigma x2, over sigma x1, sigma x2. And the other one here, there are sources x3, x4, so it's sigma x3, sigma y, sigma y, sigma x4, over sigma x3, sigma x4. I had sigma x1, sigma x2, and sigma x3, sigma x4 here, so things cancel. And I get just the sum I wanted. OK? So, like, take home message of this tree diagram bound. It's a bound that, that you obtain when you bound the probability of intersection by the expected number of intersections. And in dimension 5 and more, it will actually be sufficient to prove triviality. In dimension 4, it won't be. Because these intersection probabilities for random walks, they are such that expected number of intersections in dimension 5 and more is tending to 0 as well. While in dimension 4, it's not tending to 0. So that we will need to do something more tomorrow to treat the case where actually we are in dimension 4. But before that, we will use a tree diagram bound to get something in dimension 5 and more. OK, thank you very much, and see you tomorrow.